Museum did not win the Booker I Prize. I can't physically cope with this. Can you plagiarise yourself? Hi, I'm Livy. And I'm Kia. And we are Double Booked. Today we're going to be discussing Margaret Atwood's The Testament. There will be spoilers, of course. It'd be weird if there wasn't, because that would just be us talking about the words on the back. And you could do that yourself. We'll be doing this while drinking wine, and as you may tell, we've already started. <laughs> <laughs> Um, today we're drinking Baywood Summer Berries, a nice cheap fruity rosé at 7.5%. It was about £4 from Lidl. Other basic supermarkets are available, <laughs> but this is the one close to us. And cheap, because we are students. So the Testament. The Testament's is the sequel to Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, which is like a legendary book. The best book. The votable. We're not having an argument yet. This is a <laughs> no, summary. <laughs> You can look forward to arguments later. <laughs> so the Testament follows three different narratives of people from Gilead. Is it about 15 years after? About 15 years after. I'll go uh, with that. The Handmaid's Tale. We're not experts. We're very definitely not experts. No. It says the English Lit students. One yeah. of the perspectives is from one of the ants, one of them's from someone outside of Gilead, mm -hmm. and one of them is from someone who grew up in Gilead. So it's ever so exciting. With Women. that sarcastic tone, do you want to give me your opinion? <laughs> one sentence, Libby. <laughs> not what I expected, and not really what I wanted. I feel like we'll be having less arguments than I expected on this one. <laughs> I'll read you my Goodreads review of it. If nothing else, this book's ability to dampen the greatness of The Handmaid's Tale is impressive. And my mum replied to that. My mum replied to that with one word. Harsh. <laughs> but true. <laughs> but true. Sorry, Margaret. Sorry, mum. <laughs> Margaret, but it's not my mother. <laughs> I'd be a lot cooler if she was. Do you ever follow some authors on Twitter and you're like, wish I hadn't. You've ruined the illusion. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> she maintains that illusion. Until she writes this book. Mm, which we're going to get into now. Yeah. <laughs> Can I start off positively? Mm-hmm. It's a really pretty book. Oh, it's so pretty. The cover's really pretty. And the inside cover. The cover art. Who did the cover art? I don't know. The cover... Cover illustration by Noma Barr. Noma Barr Design, Suzanne Dean. The cover is so clever. It's very clever. It would just be nice if it extended into the book. <laughs> I don't like rant reviews, but this is going to be a rant review. I, I can add some more positivity. Okay. Until you, you disagree with me. Give me some positivity <laughs> that I can disagree with. I really, really enjoyed the start because I was like, this is going to be amazing. So on the first like page, the first thing you read is like the three quotes from various people. And I was like, I read them and I was like... Oh, I like this. But I read them and I was like, oh, so this is exactly like The Handmaid's Tale. Which we'll get more into <laughs> later. <laughs> Someone might be stealing from their previous book. And then, like, the start of it, I was like, oh, this thing's really interesting. Get some different perspectives away from the original text. And then I was wrong. I feel like within the first chapter of each of the perspectives, I knew who they were meant to be. So I didn't get the twist. You're just more intelligent than me. I realised it about maybe like a quarter of the way through who they were. The first half of the book is supposed to be like, oh, who might they be? But I feel like if you've read the first book, you just know. Yeah, the like... two girls I think were less of a like, I know who yeah, they are. Yeah, but we know that... Should we look at my positive? Spoilers here. We yeah. know that Offred has two daughters and therefore going, oh, we're going to have two young female perspectives. Mm, but I was kind of hoping that they wouldn't be connected to the main story and I was to the hoping. first one we made. Because yeah. I thought, how interesting would it be to have a different perspective of Gilead? Because Offred is obviously only one mind. Yes. How cool would it be to see a different part of Gilead through someone else's eyes so that disappointed me a little bit i feel like the problem with making it her daughters is that it ruins all the ambiguity of the first book you know that she got yeah. out my you know that her daughter survived and you spoiler big spoiler you know that they meet them at the end and they all get back together like they're all together Ooh, again yeah. cringe yeah i literally what did i write on that i think i just wrote wtf no oh no i put ffs ff 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 <laughs> the wine is hitting me i put for fuck's sake <laughs> I wrote that I wrote that little phrase several times in this book. I feel like the ending speaks to my whole problem with the book. It felt like a YA novel. Yeah. And you know, after oh. the Hunger Games came out and there was this massive praise of dystopian YA novels. Yeah. They were all the same. I think I literally had that exact same thought. You know when um they went to send her into the they were like, Oh, we're gonna send you in. Yeah. 
that was my first FSF because I was just like, do you know what I mean? I was just like, gosh, I can't physically cope with this because they're gonna send they're gonna send a sixteen year old into Gilead to try and like not take it down, but like that sort of like yeah, yeah, take it down. We can do it. And it's just so like I hate that. It was the romance that really when. I forgot his name. Whoever she's with on the street, and she has Garth this... or whatever his name was. It was a, it was a G. G man. When she's with G man on the street, <laughs> and she develops this kind of like schoolgirl crush on her. It, just... But it, it's really brief. They're like together for like a few minutes, and then it's like. Well, that was pointless. <laughs> it was like oh. But it's okay. kind of implied at the end that she meets him again and they have children. <laughs> but it made me angry. I think that was just because of the views in the book. And I know that that's the views of Gilead, but I was just getting really furious reading it. I feel like Gilead. I'm very sick. Felt less terrifying this time it felt less terrifying and more just like oh my god and i think it's because we had the outside of you looking into yeah. gilead it felt a lot smaller when you read the handmaid's tale that is offred's world it yes. seems so like everything is gilead whereas this obviously has that bit outside so it's like looking into Gilead, it's this tiny little place, it's kind of struggling a bit, they're trying to keep their grips on everything, it just doesn't seem to have the same effect. I feel like Offred's narrative felt very like enclosed and you were with her the entire time, but I didn't get that connection to these three characters. No. Maybe that is because it's structured in a way where it's always broken up with someone new. Coming back to that, you know, it's again, they're echoing The Handmaid's Tale, he has the, the lecturer, she has the lecturer at the end again, yeah. and it's the same lecturers, it's going, a year ago we talked about The Handmaid's Maid's tail. Now we're going to talk about this. And it was literally just like it seemed like a carbon copy yeah. of the of the historical notes from Handmaid's Tale. It literally just felt like the Handmaid's Tale repeating itself yeah. but in a worse way. It was so genius in Handmaid's Tale because it kind of made you question everything you've read before. But here we know that it's testimony and therefore it doesn't have that kind of intimateness that is questioned at the end. Mm. And plus we know because it's several different perspectives, we know different perspectives of it. Whereas in yeah. Handmaid's Tale it's just Offred so we're in the dark when she's in the dark it's very it is it's that very narrow sort of view of it and the ambiguity makes it the more interesting Aunt Lydia's is first <laughs> see I I didn't care about her but this book doesn't seem like Aunt Lydia when you read it from her perspective yeah. I was like this isn't Aunt Lydia I feel like it Aunt Lydia in the Handmaid's Tale is this kind of distant voice it seems kind of Kind of like just hovering in like a puppeteer over the puppet, like yeah. controlled, you know, just sort of like always ever present but never quite seen. I feel like humanising her, it felt like it kind of dampened her role in Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, I feel like if I go back and read Handmaid's Tale now, I'm going to feel differently about it. Yeah. Or like it won't seem as good, which I, I hate to have happened. Though I will say the one thing I did enjoy about Aunt Lydia's perspective, I liked seeing the sorting of the women. I thought that was really interesting. I You're gonna disagree. With didn't me. like it. I liked her as some kind of like omniscient figure. I don't know. Maybe it's because I was kind of detached from her anyway. It didn't seem as scary. She just seemed like, well, this happened. Oh, yeah, and then I met a guy, and he said, "You want to be part of my, you know, <laughs> founding nation." <laughs> and then Scooby Doo happened. <laughs> the mystery machine going around killing her. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying to wear like picture Aunt Lydia, but like in Daphne <laughs> costume. Oh, Daphne, not more of a Velma. <laughs> Off Fred. <laughs> Shall I say that in a different tone? But <laughs> off Fred. Scooby Doo had better plot twists than this book. <laughs> I love Scooby Doo. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Scooby Doo did not win the Booker could... Prize. Are we going to go into it? Should this have won the Booker Prize? Who was it joint with? Do you know? I don't know. All I know is it was the first like black woman in like 30 years or something to win it. I think maybe she should have won it on her own because yeah. I haven't read her stuff but I, I feel like they should were look just... into it but this is not great. I feel like they were just kind of making up from the fact they snubbed Handmaid's Tale when that came out. Maybe. Because Handmaid's Tale was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Like one of my favourite books. I'm so she... disappointed. Mm. I love you Margaret. I literally have a post that says, do I care about Anne Lidley though? Do you actually? <laughs> do I care about Anne no. The oh, bit where... in Handmaid's Tale where it's like a rat in a maze is yeah. free to go wherever it wants as long as it's still in the maze. Mm. But that would phrase it better than that. Yeah. And it mentions the rat in the maze again. I was like, well, just can you plagiarise yourself? Because if that's possible, you have. <laughs> it felt like less of a inside throwback and more yeah. of a see, look, I'm still clever. Mm. Though I will say, though, that like the start of my, like the first few pages of my well, first few couple of pages I, of my annotations, 
are quite positive. We are the kind of people who annotate books. That's the level of yeah. that you've got here. I feel like I had one quote the entire time where I put a post-it note and it was like, oh, this is beautiful. What was it? I'm not sure. It is about Lydia's perspective where it says, one person alone is not a full person with the existing relation to others. Oh, Because it felt like something Aunt Lydia from The Handmaid's Tale would say. Precious Flower chapter. So it's the second chapter, yeah. isn't it? Which is the girl inside. I was having, I wrote notes on my phone. I went, I just care about Agnes though. And then about five minutes away I went, wait, no I don't. <laughs> yeah, see I really cared about Agnes to start with. I, and I was like, I love the imagery she was using to describe stuff and the whole dolls. Like the first chapter of her is just full of little hearts and like, I oh, like Agnes got dolls me and kept them going until she met Nicole. Yeah, when she met Nicole I was like, oh uh, gosh, please no. <laughs> I didn't like Nicole's. I feel like Nicole's narrative was I, to the chosen one. Yeah. And I also feel like the way she, her name kept changing and yeah. her per, she did dress differently. We hadn't spent enough time with her to establish her personality. Yes. So every time she changed disguises, it almost felt like she was a different person. I couldn't get behind her and follow her. I When she went into the aunt's house, I feel like she acted up too much. It didn't feel realistic. It felt like... <laughs> it felt almost like fan fiction-y. Yeah, a totalitarian <laughs> regime would not let you get away with this sort of thing. Yeah, it really like I think that's what was my main issue with the book is that the fact it didn't feel like a scary totalitarianism yeah. regime. Like I never felt like Gilead regime. had any threats. It didn't feel it, even at the end of Handmaid's Tale you aren't sure if she's saved. Except you are now because you know she's saved. It takes every <sighs> bit of ambiguity. The bits I loved about Handmaid's Tale have now been ruined. Yeah. But I was so gripped to start with that like I was so hyped for this book. I so wanted this book to be amazing. I was I was looking forward to it. Like I put off reading it because I wanted to like read it more. In Offred's narrative, you felt like you were hearing Offred's voice. Here, I felt like I was being written yeah. to. I liked the idea of this twisted Bible story and I how. I liked it, but I just but it felt like it was. I felt like it was the same message as Handmaid's Tale, just more force-fed. It was less subtle. And then at the end when she actually, you know, when she reads, she starts to learn how to read. And she actually yeah. reads the Bible. She's like, this is no. Like they don't even like. She still almost believes in it, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm never quite sure where they stand, especially Becca. You seem like you're really into it, at the same time you don't seem like you're into it. Like, yeah. I feel like the dentist in this book feels like a parody of yeah. the Doctor. In it the almost first feels book. like it couldn't have been written if it, it was written by someone other than Atwood as a like response yes. for Handmaid's Tale because of how much it's like parodied, parodied it and like used the same sort of format. I feel like she thinks that the world's gotten a lot more stupid since the eighties. You know, I laughed earlier when I was reading it. Yeah, I'm going to read that. I just sat found in my it. bed laughing randomly, and Kia was like, "Why are you laughing? I don't think it's a you know." No, I don't think it's that funny. <laughs> but it was just because it caught me off guard, and it just the line was. I think it's in Agnes. Yeah, it's an Agnes's perspective. It just goes, the adult female body was one big booby trap as far as I could tell. But she'd just been talking about boobs beforehand. Like, and so it just made but me she's laugh. she's not funny the rest of the time. No. Is she being funny? She was on about periods and like hitting puberty and the blood between her legs and everything. And then she just sort of went, the adult, fe the adult female body is one big booby trap. And I just, just made me laugh. I feel like the problem with this book is it's about plot. Whereas Handmaid's Tale was so much about the character and it was all in her world. I love character development over plot. In yeah. my opinion, I'd much rather get to know a character than get to know a story in most cases. Obviously, a lot happens in Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. But there's not actually that much action compared to memory and just her thinking. I feel like it's good to get in people's heads. And I feel like that's what was really effective about Handmaid's Tale. Was it really managed to get into the heads, into yeah. the head of Offred. Whereas this feels to sort of, it, it sort of dances about a bit and just, yeah. Even when I didn't agree with Offred, I wanted her to do well. Like her romance with Nick, you kind of mm. regret in a way. Because you see her moving away from May Day and you feel like something is bound to go wrong and you disagree with what she's doing but yeah. you see why whereas in the nice way possible Nicole just seems like a bit of a knob yeah she's the hero of the story and she's, an, she's not like I don't even care about her really yeah I mean want to care about a character I don't care about her I can't relate to her on any level whatsoever and it's not like oh we don't like her I didn't feel attached to her anyway well, like, so when her parents died like her I got very I, nonchalant <laughs> oh my parents got blown up she was like, she was like, oh, the shop's been, you know, there was a car bomb, and they're like, oh no, that's really bad. And they go, but your parents were inside, and she's like, 
Oh. Do it is really sort of just like she's okay. Yeah, she's too stupid. Yeah. She's not stupid. I mean, like she's just <laughs> ignorant. She doesn't seem to love her parents enough before they get blown up. I got annoyed at this bit. This is when she found out that she was babying a co-op and goes, oh, they're like, oh, well, this girl, woman's explained to her, like, oh, you escaped Gilead, you were born there. There were a lot of people out looking for you, plus the media blitz. And she goes, like baby Nicole, I wrote an essay about her at school. And then the other woman looks at the floor and then looks, oh, it's a man, sorry, not a woman, a man. Then he looks straight at me, you are baby Nicole, end of chapter. And I was just like, it's just a bit where she's like, Oh, that's just like Baby Nicole. I wrote an essay on her. I you are her. I feel like the idea of this better country outside is too forced, like their school's too good. Because I felt like the point of The Handmaid's Tale was this could happen now and we're yeah. supposed to be these people in Canada, when currently in Wales, but in Canada. <laughs> it's not like we're sat here with so much detail about... It these... feels too far in the future, whereas with Offer's narrative yeah. it felt more current. Everyone outside of Gilead seems to be too woke but too stupid. Everyone seems to only care about Gilead outside. Yeah. So it, they're, like they're all just sort of like we the only thing we know about people outside outside of Gilead is that they hate Gilead or that they're like willy in support of it. Yeah. But like there's nothing that no one seems to have life that's separate from Gilead and I feel like it's a bit weird in that sense. Yeah, I feel like maybe that's why I didn't feel attached to Aunt Lydia because her life outside of um, Gilead was shown for a very brief amount of time and it was very just like blase, oh I was a lawyer. and then I was a lawyer. lawyer. Some guys with guns came in, took me to a stadium, they shot some women in front of us, I then had to go in for an interview, like a job interview, I got the job. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's I just a... like the idea of Aunt Lydia at a job interview. <laughs> Tell me, someone you find inspirational. What made you want to work here? <laughs> Got any holidays planned? What are your weaknesses? <laughs> mm, maybe the fact I'm not a dictator? <laughs> she's a... Well, she's a dick. I don't feel like it felt like Aunt Lydia in this, though. Mm. I feel like they're two completely different characters and they're meant to be the same woman, almost like at the same time. I'm, I was reading this going... But Aunt Lydia wouldn't do that, or she wouldn't have done what she did in Handmaid's Tale if this is what she was thinking and writing. Yeah, I feel like she is too self-aware when she is taken in for the in for her to be indoctrinated and then to not be indoctrinated again within the space of like 10 years, 20 years. Yeah, well she writes, she starts writing this, doesn't she? when she still meet in like off it like it's implied that she was writing this the whole time that yeah. she's been in gilead and it's like if she was doing that she wouldn't have acted the way she'd done in handmaid's tale yeah i also don't understand why she has access to paradise lost i still don't get it there is no use for that why do they have use of this library and that the answer like i understand that they're allowed to read and things but surely the regime would have made sure that there weren't going to be any books that could possibly like influence them like they might you know they and the actual version of the bible and stuff like it's quite dangerous I... material to have around a regime maybe that's why it fell so quickly because it it's literally implied that it falls at the end of the book which is 15 years after offer its narrative though... which is only just the regime's only just started. Yeah, even though in the first historical notes they talk about the middle and the later Gileadan period. Yeah, whereas in this it's like it sounds like it was all done and like all done and out within like twenty years. Like yeah. it started twenty years later, it finished. They talk so much about them being in war and there's this kind of very intense, strict system. When are you gonna have time to read Paradise Lost? <laughs> I live a very dull life and oh, I've got and then time they, to read Paradise they Lost. The, they got all the ants in and they're like, you're the ones that are gonna be creating the laws and stuff for the women's side of it. And I was a bit like, I don't know if you got that feeling, but I was a bit like, oh, this is a bit weird. Yeah, because they mentioned in the first historical notes there was this man who was in charge of creating all the uniforms and stuff. And yeah, it seemed to be up to these like four cool women who were so clearly mirroring the founding fathers. Yeah, apart from Aunt Lydia had a gold frame and the rest of them had silver frames because she was the most important, which you don't really get in the first one either. I know, she's just such a little... And when someone gets a visit from her... a mundane her. aunt in the first one. She's just yeah. another person trotting out this kind of... But in of... this one, she's got a statue, she... people leave offerings to her. She see... People treat her like she's a god. When you get a visit from Aunt Lydia, like she doesn't yeah. Agnes, she gets one, she's like, what, I'm actually meeting Aunt Lydia, the Aunt Lydia. Whereas she pops in and out of other people's homes in the Handmaid's Tale and no one cares. No one cares. She's just... When it's implied they should be caring. Yeah, Aunt Lydia in the first one seems like a mouthpiece, whereas here she's an idol. Yeah. 
And they have that danger. They think that it's going to be like this cult uprising or something because of her. I'm now imagining Aunt Lady on Pop Idol. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, do you know what? She'd be really good at Eurovision. I could see her on Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, they let Australia in. I dislike her. She made a political joke here. <laughs> We're not putting it in. <laughs> no, but it was quite funny. <laughs> It was not for a book podcast. <laughs> We're not going to be reading uh, the Communist <laughs> Manifesto next. <laughs> I just, I'd like this, sorry, I'm flicking through my copy as we're talking and I just put, what am I doing here? I thought, this place is weird as fuck. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, Nicole's just effing and jeffing the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that she's trying to emphasise the fact that Nicole was outside Gilead and so has this freedom to swear. Whereas when, and then when she comes into Gilead, everyone's like, oh, I didn't hear that. Oh, oh, you're swearing. That's so bad. And uh, I feel like they're over swearing to uh, show that. Atwood is a living icon. Oh, yeah, until, I love her. I do up love her. Until this point, I would have invited her to my imaginary dinner party. But she is not a cool teenager. <laughs> she does not know how to be a cool teenager. I do love Atwood. I do love her other books. This sounds like I'm really tearing her yeah. down. The but Handmaid's like, Tale is one of my favourite books. It is. She is. It's the only um, Atwood I've read. Sorry, guys. Oh, I love the Penelope ad. And Oryx and Crake. I love Oryx and Crake as well. We will learn as this continues. <laughs> That Olivia has read every book in the world. <laughs> Olivia Not true. has read books that aren't written yet <laughs> at this point. I've read about four books in my entire life compared to her. But we are both English literature students, yeah. Well. <laughs> I'm doing English literature and Kia's doing English lit and creative writing because she's the more creative one. You, ha- you have to read some of your poetry at some point on the podcast because your poetry's amazing. Well, I thought I'd copyright that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get some exposure. <laughs> From our like one subscriber, which will be your mum. Thanks, mum. <laughs> it would be tragic if my mum didn't even listen to this. It's just a compilation of like me listening to my mum, me talking about my mum, and then I phone her up and it's just radio silence. <laughs> oh, bless. Yeah, I found another example of um, Sir Faith, Nicole. It's because she's called Jade for most of the narrative, like for some of the narrative, and she's called what's she called before then? See, I don't care about her because. I don't even know her real name. Well, her real name's Nicole, but... What is a name? I don't care. What, what's in a name? <laughs> what's in a name? Would it Nicole by any other name? name? Be as an idiot. I don't, I don't. I don't know the quote. Yes. Would the would the rose, rose by any other name smell just as so sweet. sweet? We're not it, smelling the coal. <laughs> but there's a bit where she goes. They're talking about like, she's in Gilead and they're talking about like rape and stuff. And she goes. And Becca's like, you shouldn't entice men. Says Becca. What happens if you do? Is partly your fault. And Jade looked from one one to the other of us, victim blaming. She said, really. <laughs> it just sounds. This feels like my A level notes from my handmaid's copy. Like. She's supposed to be like this story character, not some idiot northerner. I feel like she's an A level student just like commenting on like the book. Really? My favorite. Are you kidding me? My favorite thing is the way that they train her like she's going to punch her way out of Gilead. (laughs) And then she does. There's one line and they're like, Has she learnt to kill by her thumbs yet or something? And they're like, Not yet, but she's nearly there. It's like, This all happens in the space of like a page. Like she enters and then she like, leaves like able to kill people with her hand and then she does almost kill someone by punching yeah. them and i just it feels so like offred could not look up without suspicion and she's able to do so much and she's basically karate kids yeah her. she basically uh-huh. yeah. karate kids the ant there's a line i think this is yeah this is aunt lydia's like narrative and this is as they like leave and she goes the clock ticks the minutes pass i wait i wait Fly well, my messengers, my silver doves, my destroying angels, land safely. And that line just makes me laugh because I think it sounds bad. <laughs> Is that really bad? It just feels very dramatic and like, like you. it doesn't feel like Aunt Lydia, yeah. for one. It also doesn't feel like it fits the style in a way that's not how she's writing it like a diary no, she's like, is she writing it because it sounded like she aunt lydia is writing she it. is writing it yeah and i just feel like you wouldn't write the clock ticks comma the minutes pass comma i wait full stop i wait it just feels like why would you write that it sounds like the sort of thing i'd write in my diary when i was like nine years yeah. old like trying to sound like posh or something too heightened i feel like aunt lydia <laughs> is trying to be redeemed too much 
Whereas off red was so flawed. Yeah. Off red was in a feminist text, so it's not a feminist. I feel like the flaws in off red made her such a great character and made The Handmaid's Tale such a great book. Atwood in this book is trying to make each of the characters so lovable that they're not lovable. Yeah. Sort of thing. Like you, you want to sympathize. She's trying to get you to sympathize with every single character. And I just feel like you can't do that in a book and then she chucks in a few men like you want to, she wants you to sympathize with all the women and then she chucks in a few hideous men to break it up and i just feel like yeah the aunt lydia who was saving women from a rapist is not the aunt lydia who was telling women it was their own fault for being raped and forcing janine to cry about her rape yeah it doesn't feel like the same character but to be fair there is lydia's quite a generic name yeah maybe just, just a different aunt can lydia. i just say though at the end they do say that it's possible it's the same Aunt Lydia. So in actual fact, it could be a different Aunt Lydia and just scratch our entire conversation and it would be better. But I mean, it's not though, is it? And like the last bit where they had like the in loving memory of Becca on Immortal, I was slightly confused. She died trying to be... Yeah, Jay. but it's still very... Oh, it just felt cringe. It, I feel like I really enjoyed the first sort of quarter and then towards it, towards the middle, at the second quarter, towards halfway point sort of thing, I started getting, oh, I'm not quite sure I'm as behind it anymore. And then the last half, I was like, this is just like someone trying to rip off an, a young adult fiction sort of thing, trying to appeal to another audience. And I was like, I can't deal with this. I feel like the problem <clears> is <throat> it would be a fine YA book, but with The Handmaid's Tale, every single sentence felt perfect. Yeah. It's felt beautiful. And they stole the boat. <laughs> Did they steal a boat or did they carry a boat? No, no, the boat was part of their escape. It was part of the chain. There was a people like helping them escape, got on the boat and then the boat broke down and they were like, oh no, what are we going to do? We can just stay here. Oh, they were fine. And they're like, oh no, we're going to get on the rowing boat. So they go onto a rowing boat. That breaks down and then they have to actually row instead of motor. And then they nearly get caught in a storm. Agnes doesn't know what rowing is. Yeah, Agnes doesn't know a lot of things. And I feel like, I don't know, it just felt very unreal. For some reason when offered what came before, yeah. it felt more like, oh, okay, I can relate to her whereas Agnes just doesn't know anything and I know that's because she was brought up inside this regime but a regime that lets things slip I feel like so often too much was let slip for it to be believable that she would know what rowing was yeah exactly that's what that's what I meant that is a better way of phrasing if, what I was saying. if you can give children pliers that they can try and kill themselves with second tears that just sounds like you are the saboteur <laughs> If you can give people bush scissors. No, they were giving them flower arranging lessons. Yeah. Which I admit are quite If fun. you would give them a sharp weaponry, you can tell them what rowing is. I, I feel like a lot happens in such a short amount of time that it's scary. I felt like the bit leading up to her preparing to get married felt a bit... It was so rough. It was like a red herring, but you mm -hmm. knew that it was a red herring. Yeah, but also the guy that she was going to marry, what's his name? Commander Jude, is it? Judge. Judge. Like Carrie Judd from McFly. Anyway, that's definitely not who I pictured the entire time. <laughs> they mention so many times that Judd gets through wives, they mysteriously die, and then he's in the market for a child bride. Like, they mention that so many times that when it comes around to it, it's like, hmm, she has three people to choose between. The first one's Commander Judd. Here's a whole thing about why she should marry him. And then it's like, oh, no, there are these two other guys. It's like, I wonder who will it be? And then it's like, no, it's the fact that you all have the choice. And then it's like, actually, you don't have a choice. And it's like, I also felt like hand gestures. her replacement stepmom felt mm. like an off-brand version of the wife from the first time I saw. Oh, I did also, she like... killed her husband. Scandal. Basically, so much happened in this book. There was so many like, oh, here's an unnecessary fact about this character that does not add to the plot. I feel like it's because we didn't, I didn't care about the characters. I want mm. someone to reply to this and tell me why this was a brilliant book. Please tell us if it's a brilliant book and we've just completely misread it because I would love to enjoy it. I think it has like four and a half I stars wanted to enjoy on it. Goodreads. It's four and a half stars. Okay, if you're out there giving it a five star review, boosting the ratings, please let us know. I've just finished my wine. Liv has drank half a bottle of wine, I suppose. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I love my wine. Wine, women, and song. Who said that? I don't know. I don't know, but I love wine. I love women. I love songs. <laughs> I do not love <laughs> the testaments by Margaret Atwood. <laughs> but I do not love this book, but I love Margaret Atwood. It's like, I can't take it off my shelf because it's too pretty. It is such a pretty book. And it, honestly, it feels so good to hold it. And I'm like, my, my baby. I'm my hugging it, by the way. <laughs> my Handmaid's Tale copy is the film copy. Not film, it? the TV show mm. copy. I have not seen the TV show. Oh, I so wanted to enjoy this book. 
If you're listening to this and you haven't gathered already, don't read this book unless you have to. Or read it, and if you like it, tell us that we're wrong. Yeah. I like and tell it. us why, don't just say that we're wrong. <laughs> because that, that Libby. Shut up. <laughs> shut up. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, maybe I should shut up. That would be a very, that should be silence. <laughs> Or just one northern I, woman going crazy. Maybe I've hallucinated you. Maybe. Maybe you're talking to no one. You're going to pay this podcast back and it'll just be <laughs> silence with a little occasional like, Hey doctor, I've uh, passed southern woman in my brain. I don't know how to get her out. Drink more wine. Drink more wine. Maybe she'll stay. <laughs> give her wine and she'll stay. How to get women to love you. Give them wine. That's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Take that out. Kira's our local comedian. It's Kira a very small laugh. place. <laughs> it just, this book just shows you that people will disappoint you. Who am I supposed to invite to my imaginary dinner party now? I know. Well, you can just ignore <laughs> and forget the fact she published this book. That's true. I've only heard <coughs> Handmaid's Tale. So that's, she's actually... 50, she's ruined 50% of her reputation. Well, read read some of her others. Read Penelope. I know we're reading that in the future. Look out for it on our podcast. It's on in our... like 20 weeks' time. Yeah, it's on our reading list. It's the Penelope ad. We love some... Um... We love that one. It's just going to be it's Lord smart. Byron and Ruth Bader Ginsburg in a room on their own. Oh, bless them. I'll come join. <laughs> you... If there's wine, I'll join. I've replaced Margaret Atwood with, with, with Livy. There yeah. we go. I've replaced Margaret Atwood, everyone. <laughs> Totally as skilled and talented. Well, can you do some satire? This felt like satire of YA. I've hit it. This feels satirical. I don't think it was good enough to be satirical. <laughs> savage. I'm never this savage. It's because I've drunk wine. Literally half my so notes. this is going to be really interesting. On my phone up. I want to DNF this so bad. Maggie, you've disappointed me. <laughs> Oh, Maggie. Maggie. You tell me off for calling people by their first name and not their surname, and you're shortening it to Maggie. At least I call her Margaret. We've called her Margaret Atwood for quite a long time. I, I call know. her Maggie. Maggie. Hi, Maggie. She's not my least favourite Maggie, by far, but she has disappointed me. Who's your least favourite Maggie? Is that, yeah, Northern. How many stars would you give this book? What? Okay. Because you've got to give it a star, because that's how... The star system works. I'll yeah. give it half a star. No. You can't that's give really it half a star. Okay, I'll give it... We, we do Goodreads rules, you've got to do full stars, one to five. Can't do like a point one? No. No, it's not that bad. I'm, 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 yeah. I would You're think... being facetious. Um, I'll give it one star to you, so our average is one star anyway. So we give this book one star. star. It was a disappointing I'm sorry, Maggie, star. I love you, Maggie. Go the people on. you love always disappoint you. I don't love... No one loves me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't love anyone. <laughs> Well, that was a way to start this. I love everyone, okay? But no one loves me because I'm unlovable. <laughs> and that's how to, how melancholic we feel after this book. And half a bottle of wine. The only way is up. Speaking of up, you're going to be very excited because what are we reading next time? Next week, we're going back to our childhoods and reading Matilda by Roald Dahl. Because I have discovered... That not only is Livy obsessed with Matilda. From my posters and my cushions and my duvet cover. I can currently see three versions of Matilda without moving my head in her tiny little dorm room. <laughs> so, yeah, if yeah. you want to read along with us, it's not going to take you very long this time. No, and you might have already read it. I hope you've already read it. If you haven't read it, I'm going to kill you. I won't kill you. That's <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't already read it. You have two weeks to read it before I come and hunt you down. Lovely. You're an adult now. You've become the thing Roald Dahl seek to destroy. That was it. That was our first little foray into podcasting. Yeah. Hopefully you liked it. Thank you for sticking along this far. If you have stuck along this if you've journey it, with us. If you've made it this far, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Please do. Listen to us again. Please like this podcast as Please well. Please like us. Please do some comments. Please like us. I'm desperate. I mean, I'm, I'll, come on. If you give me a like, then like that'll make my day. And also treat yourself to a bottle of wine as well. Yeah. Because if you've made it this far, you might need it. If you've made it far into the book, you definitely will. Yeah. So, we'll see you next time. Ta-ta!